welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing N-Link's midstream stock and analyzing its financial ratios. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. I'll respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me, receive a custom valuation, or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. N-Link is an oil and gas midstream company. Midstream refers to the points in the oil production process that fall between upstream and downstream. Midstream activities include the storage, processing, and transportation of petroleum. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company. Market cap is $1.3 billion. That's the value of the company according to the stock market. And they're trading at $2.74 a share. To get shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price. Gives you shares outstanding, 489 million. Let's look at the financials. Free cash flow is how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows and then discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. Free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are property, plant, and equipment. If a company has positive free cash flow, it has the ability to pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it might not be able to do any of those things. This company has negative $91 million of free cash flow in 2017 and has a really small positive in 2016 and 18. It does have a decent number in 2019, but it's all over the place. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And this company has negative net income in three of the four years, so their financials don't look so great. Their revenue is the sales, that's on top of the income statement, and it grew a lot from 2016 to 2018, but came back down in 2019. But it seems to be on a good path. Let's look at the financial statements to try to understand why they have so many negatives. So this is the income statement. The very top line is revenue. Then you have the cost of revenue. Those are the expenses the company incurred in order to generate the revenue. Then you have the gross profit. Then you have operating expenses. These are expenses that are not directly related to making your product. A common operating expense is payroll for marketing or payroll for human resources. Then there's operating income. This is the money the company makes on its everyday operational business. And below that is the interest they pay in their debt. And I like to make sure the operating income is above the interest they pay in their debt because you want to receive a dividend without the company going to more debt. Everything looks good so far. The thing that really stands out is the special income charges. And if you open up that link, it says write-offs. So they had a lot of impairments. 1.1 billion in 2019, 873 million in 2016. So impairments are expenses that bring down your net income. And they brought it down to negative 1.1 billion in 2019. But impairments are non-cash items, so it does not affect cash flow. That's why they had positive $237 million of cash flow in 2019, yet negative 1.1 billion of net income. An asset is impaired if its market value is less than the value in a balance sheet. Assets that are usually impaired are accounts receivable, goodwill, equipment, plus many other intangible and fixed assets. The balance sheet is a snapshot representing what the company owns and owes, so the numbers should be as accurate as possible. If the numbers are overstated, it can be misleading to investors. To give you an example, say you purchased a building last year for $10 million. And this year, the value of the building was $6 million due to a really weak real estate market. You would have to reduce the value of the building on the balance sheet from $10 million to $6 million. You would also have to pass through a $4 million loss onto the income statement. This is a non-cash item for this year's financials because you paid for the building last year, which was reflected in last year's financials. Also, you would have to add back the $4 million on the cash flow from operations section of the cash flow statement. The result of this impairment reduces your net income, which reduces your earnings per share. That negatively affects your P-E ratio. It also reduces the assets on your balance sheet which in effect reduces your return on assets ratio. An impairment affects lots of ratios and metrics. So you can see the impairment of 1.1 billion brought their net income down to negative 1.1 billion. Let's look at a cash flow statement. To calculate free cash flow, it's cash flow from operations. In 2019, it was 991 million. 
minus CapEx. That's $754 million. So they did have positive free cash flow that year, even though they reported such a big negative net income. I'll show you why. If you open up operating cash flow, it starts with net income, and then it adds back non-cash items, like depreciation and amortization. It also adds back that asset impairment, because it's a non-cash item, because you actually paid for the building in the past, which brought down your cash flow that year, but this year it doesn't affect cash flow. In 2017, they had positive net income, yet negative free cash flow, because in 2017, what jumped out at me was deferred taxes. Deferred taxes are not back taxes. It's just a difference between the way the IRS and GAAP, the way companies report their financials. So the company does owe $197 million in taxes, but it's not due yet. It's due in the near future. So the company will have to pay this $197 million. Since you see a negative $197 million on a cash flow statement, that means this deferred tax amount benefited them on their income statement, so their net income was higher of $197 million. But in future years, it's gonna be lower when they actually pay the taxes. Let's look at a capital structure. $4.8 billion of debt, $2.1 billion of equity. And the interest rate they pay in their debt is 4.46%. They don't pay taxes because they usually report negative net income or they defer their income taxes. Oil and gas companies receive lots of benefits and subsidies from the U.S. government because they provide a product that's really needed. Other industries don't have as much flexibility as oil and gas industries do in deferring taxes. Their cost of equity is 29.35%. To figure out cost of equity, we use a capital asset pricing model. And part of the CAPM formula is the beta. Beta is a measure of a stock's volatility in relation to the overall market. The S&P 500 has a beta of 1. This stock has a beta of 3.52, so that's really volatile. If the S&P goes up 1%, this stock should, on average, go up 3.52%. And if the S&P goes down 1%, this stock should, on average, go down 3.52%. Beta is calculated using regression analysis. Regression analysis allows you to examine the relationship between two or more variables. Beta is systematic risk related to the market, such as external factors like interest rate changes, policy changes, wars, etc. Systematic risk cannot be diversified away. Unsystematic risk is the risk of an individual company, which can be diversified away by adding more stocks to your portfolio. And this company's WAC is 12.14%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. The WAC is a discount rate companies use when they want to take on a new project. The WAC is a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows for this model. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for that's 1.7 billion. We discount those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $1.7 billion. We divide that by 489 million shares. We get a calculated stock price of 353. They're trading at 274, so they're trading at a 22% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is even higher. They're saying the stock price is worth $5.20. Simply Wall Street's valuation is based off of the average analyst estimate. Let's see where the stock has been trading the past few years. So it looks like the stock price broke $20 a few years back, but it seems to be really struggling the past couple of years. So it looks like it could be a really good value. The dividend payment was up to 28 cents per share at one point, but it seems like it's been dropping. It's down to 9 cents currently. That's probably to be more in line with the stock price and also to conserve cash. They currently have a 14% dividend yield, so they pay a nice dividend. But if the stock price goes up, the dividend yield goes down. And if the stock price goes down, the dividend yield goes up. Part of the dividend yield formula is the stock price. It is good to remember that a company's financial performance is not 100% correlated to the stock price. It can help or hurt the stock price. The only thing that is directly correlated to the stock price is supply and demand of the market. The stock price will go up if more people want to buy a stock. The stock price will go down if more people want to sell a stock. It is possible for a company to report great financials and its stock price keeps going down. It is also possible for a company to report weak financials and its stock price keeps going up. The market is forward thinking. Part of investing in a stock market is understanding market sentiment and investor psychology, which can be the hardest thing to figure out. Let's look at the financial ratios. 
They have a bad PE. The median for the market is 16.2. The average is 18.0. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They have a negative PE, so we can't look at this ratio. They do have a great price to sales ratio. The median is 2.0. The average is 4.7. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, they're at 0.2. So investors are paying 20 cents for $1 of revenue. Price to book is really good as well. The median is 2.3, the average is 4.9. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. I like to see below 3.5, they're at 0.6. So investors are paying 60 cents for $1 of book value. Equity is assets minus liabilities on a balance sheet. A weak interest coverage ratio, the median is 4.0, the average is 13.0. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. I like to see above 2.0, they're at 1.9. So they could almost cover two times their interest payments. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes. It's also called operating income on the income statement. Negative ROE, the median is 12%, the average is 13%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%, but they're negative, so we can't look at their ROE. A low current ratio, the median is 1.3, the average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. I like to see between 1.2 and 2. They're at 1.0, so they can almost cover their current liabilities. Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Examples are cash, accounts receivables, and inventory. Current liabilities are debts and payables that are due within 12 months. Examples are current debt and accounts payable. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos on 27 oil and gas midstream companies. End link is right here. And if they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they have a negative PE, so we can't look at the PE. They have a great price of sales and price to book ratio, much better than the average. Current ratio is a little lower than the average at 1.0. Negative ROE, we can't look at the ROE. Their debt is a little higher than average. Market cap, they're 1.3 billion, which is a good amount lower than average. Average is 10.1 billion. They pay a nice dividend, 14% dividend yield. The average is almost 12%. To summarize, I do have them trading at a 22% discount because their stock price has come down so much, but their ratios and financials look a bit weak. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me, receive a custom valuation or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on a link in the description below. Thanks for watching.